Welcome everyone and thank you for attending our webinar, Beyond Digital Transformation, What AI Means to the Steel Industry. My name is Tom Trapel and I'll be your moderator today. Today our guests are Martin Preventure, Industry Principal for Mining Metals and Materials at OSISOC, Dr. Roberto Linares, AI Solution Principal with Pechum, and Pabal Achara, Head of Industrial AI at Pechum. Today's webinar will take roughly 45 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. But before we get started, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping notes. First, this webinar is being recorded, and we will be providing the recording and slides after the webinar. You can expect a, a follow-up email from us within a few days. Also, we'll be conducting a couple polls, and your participation is highly appreciated. And if you have a question, please use the Q&A platform on the WebEx digital event platform. You can find that panel to the right of your screen. Um, if we were not able to get to everyone's question, um, we will certainly follow up with response afterward. And with that, I will now hand it off to Martin Preventure to get started with our discussion today. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tom. So in today's webinar, we'll, first we'll have an overview of what it means when we talk about digital transformation for the steel industry. And then we'll look at some of the concepts regarding artificial intelligence and how AI artificial intelligence can help, can help us improve our operations. And then we'll have a look at how we can implement autonomous operations or what we call autopilot or AI pilot mode. So today we're now in the fourth industrial revolution, often referred to as Industry 4.0. The first revolution was mechanical revolution at the beginning of 18th century. It was followed by the electrical revolution at the beginning of the 20th century, and then the electronics revolution that came with automated systems in the 70s. And now we're in the fourth revolution, what we call, what, what is referred to uh, cyber systems. It's taking actually into consideration all the data that is now available with those mechanical, electrical, and electronic assets. So in order to take advantage of all that data, we need to get the proper tools and mindset this is what we will now call a digital transformation of the industry. Now, what does it mean for the steel industry? Why would we want to take advantage of all that data? And what value can it really bring? Well, that's a fact. Digital transformation is currently changing the industry. And that change is fundamentally about using data, especially operational data, to operate more efficiently and, of course, open new revenue streams. But what is operational data exactly? Well, it's, it's basically data coming from operations that includes handling raw materials, uh, mobile assets, manufacturing, processing, transportation, data that comes from sensors, dispatch systems, GPS, laboratory systems, coming from uh, PLC systems, SCADA systems. So it's basically real-time data and historical data, but it can, can also be future data, and we'll see it in, in, in the webinar. So collecting all that data can be done, of course, manually, but ideally it will be automated because, of course, we're talking about lots of data here. And how can all of this operational data transform the industry? Well, as we see, as we can see here, ArcelorMittal, the largest steel producer in the world, which processes iron from their mines and makes steel bars, wires, etc. Well, in 2015, their long products mill in Canada started integrating their Pi system for real-time information with their manufacturing execution system and their ERP system. This helped them significantly improve slab quality by identifying issues on time, such as, for example, a quick speed reduction event which may generate micro cracks in the steel, or a water sprinkling that stopped during a certain period, which will also generate quality issues. So that's a great example of a digital transformation successfully achieved. Another example is Algoma Steel, which is both a primary and fabricated metals company. They use the Pi system as a key enabler to take advantage of real-time operational data, which contributed to extend the life of their blast furnace. So the relining went from the normal seven-year period to more than 12 years. It also enabled savings on the reagent cost at the desulfurization plant. And of course, it helped them achieve a minimum reduction of 5% of unplanned delays in the direct strip production complex, which resulted in 140,000 tons of production increase. Another great example of a successful digital transformation. 
So today, metals operators are looking towards operational excellence. They need to keep a good balance between safety, performance, compliance, etc. And, and to do this, workers need better tools to gain the insight they need to take action before the impacts happen. That's what we call operational intelligence. And once you have access to that operational intelligence, this is where digital transformation happens, and this is where it will deliver real value to the organization. There are at least six main areas where we can see value out of a digital transformation journey. First one, process productivity. Of course, bringing real-time information or real-time data and giving access to operators and managers and, and engineers can help all of them take actions quickly. This will represent significant productivity in many cases. Productivity increase, yeah. There are lots of different information systems actually in, 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 in those mills and smelters. Uh, those are generally not integrated, which means it's difficult to get the big pictures. So metal companies have different processes that involve significant numbers of parameters and adjustments. Increasing production often means pushing the limits of the different processes. And all those parameters are very often hard to manage from a, from a human, human being. So having access to all operational data in real time and implementing, for example, process condition monitoring can help significantly increase the throughput. In terms of energy and water management, well, metal companies spend a lot of, of, of cost or of money on energy and water. So knowing in real time what consumes the most energy or water can help identify leaks and even, even, even help identify equipments that are not or that should not be running. In terms of asset performance and reliability, well, this industry is, is an asset intensive industry. So anything that can be done to increase the uptime of the machine is worth a lot. So having access to real time operational data and combining it with asset analytics opens possibility for maintenance to go from a reactive mode or a planned maintenance mode or, or, or calendar, ba calendar based maintenance mode to a condition based maintenance or predictive maintenance or even we can start thinking about prescriptive maintenance now that we have access to the data and we, we start using artificial intelligence. In terms of our environment, health and safety, well, with all the new regulations that those companies are facing, it, it becomes critical to monitor in real time environmental aspects or health and safety aspects. In fact, not meeting some compliance rules can result in fines and or even suspension of operating licenses. So these are very important. So compliance, of course, is sometimes a challenge and having access to real-time operational data allows operators to take actions rapidly and this helps them avoid non-compliance events. In terms of quality, well, as you know, the metals industry, uh, I mean, products must meet a variety of specifications. So lack of real-time notifications for product quality deviation makes it difficult to make decisions in real time. So it's, it's usually done afterwards. So we see that we've had an issue, we try to figure out what happened, and then we try to solve it. But, but then we've had lots of quality issues that has been produced. So having access to real-time notifications for product quality uh, or for, for deviations on product quality allows the reduction of reject rates and opens the door for being able to predict quality issues once you have data and start using analytics. In terms of KPI and reporting, well, having one version of the truth is what we're getting. Data silos that, that are actually existing in, in most companies and lack of integration throughout the value chain because lots of different information systems that are generally not integrated means that it is difficult to get the big picture. So having again, having access to real-time data across all assets, all plants, makes it easy to report and generate KPI for mail performance. And actually, uh, there's a good story here I have. When I was a production manager, uh, we were struggling with a specific asset within equipment. And uh, I brought in the two, my two superintendents, uh, so superintendent for maintenance and superintendent for operations. Uh, and both came in and, and we started talking about the asset and they, both of them came in with a, a different calculation for their OE. So they both have different OEE results. So the overall equipment efficiency of the, the asset was different for both of them. So of course, 
uh, they were using different systems to calculate it. And that's when we decided to agree that on one specific decision, and we started using our single operational data infrastructure, so our real-time operational data infrastructure. So based on a 2018 McKinsey study, advanced analytics and AI applied to all that data that is generated, generated for, from uh, production and maintenance processes is the most important digital lever in the value created by a digital transformation. In fact, this will account for more than 50% of the total gains of such a transformation. So an analytics applied to big data in the metals industry can strengthen process control and boost plants' profits. For example, only for yield, energy, and throughput, analytics alone can improve the EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax depreciation, and amortization, by 2 to 3%, which is significant, while reducing manufacturing costs by 3 to 5%. And, and, and actually, this is exactly what ArcelorMittal, the FASCO, has done. They were using data for production purposes and soon realized that the data was also important for maintenance. They integrated their maintenance software with their operational data, which was the PI system. They started to move from a time-based or calendar-based approach to an automated condition-based maintenance program. For example, during an RCM analysis, they've identified that the tap hole refractory was eroding during normal use. They've identified a specific condition that was causing the tap hole issues, and they soon realized that it was related to the linear, linear motion of the hydraulic cylinder. Once the data was captured automatically, when the cylinder was reaching a specific condition, an alarm was generated, and this would automatically generate a work order in their CMMS system to resurface the tap hole. Another great example of a successful digital transformation. So, Tom, I'm going to leave it back to you for the first polling question of the webinar. Hey, thank you, Martin. At this time, we're going to be conducting a poll. You can find the, uh, the way to vote for your response to the right of your screen. Our question for you, has your company started a digital transformation journey? Uh, our answers are A, we have not started, or B, we have started but did not get results yet. C, we have started and are getting results in one of the six areas that Martin mentioned before. D, we've achieved good results in more than one area already. Or E, we are leaders in digital transformation and have succeeded in all areas. Martin, based on your experience and discussions with leaders in the steel industry, where do you see most companies with their digital transformation journey today? Well, Tom, it will be great to see, I mean, the, the, the result of the, the, that, that little survey. But for sure, I think that most companies have started. Uh, that, that's what I think. That's what I expect to see. Um, but again, please do answer the right, the, the, the truth uh, on, on that poll, because we really need to see, we really want to see what, what, what's the, the, the real aspect. But from those companies that I've met, that I've seen, I think most of them have started. Uh, actually, most of them have started and are using digital data or operational data in, in one of those aspects. So I, I cannot say that uh, a lot of companies have achieved or are getting results in, in many of those areas. Uh, most of them have started and, and with, with one specific accept, ac aspect, for example, in terms of process productivity. Uh, most companies are, have tried to improve their process productivity using operational data. Well, thank you, Martin. I'm going to be closing the poll at this time. Just take a few minutes to calculate the results. All right. And it looks like the majority of everyone has gotten started with their digital transformation journey and are seeing results in at least one of the six areas you mentioned previously, Martin. That's great. So I was, uh, I was, I was quite on, on the spot. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. Martin, back to you. Yeah, well, uh, from now, I think we can, uh, we can uh, start talking about artificial intelligence and how we can use AI once we have access to all that real-time operational data. So, Prabal and Roberto, I, I will leave it to you to start talking about AI with operational data. Thank you, Martin. This is Prabal Acharya. I'm with Petchum. I head our uh, industrial AI division. 
and been in this industry for quite some time. Um, started my journey with AI and expert systems for, uh, for an oil company, British Petroleum, and then um, had several years with uh, Waze ISOP, great years over there, and been in this uh, artificial intelligence startup and IoT analytics area for the last four years. So, Martin, thank you very much for this uh, fantastic start of this webinar. We are delighted to be here. And we really, uh, I mean, when you see these leaders as you presented, like ArcelorMittal, Algoma Steel, and all, and doing so much with the digital transformation, it's great to see that this industry is actually um, moving forward with this uh, journey. Our presentation will be in a couple of phases. First, we will just discuss what are we doing together with OSISoft and with our customers in this industry, and then go into deep dive into a couple of use cases, of, uh, three use cases for uh, steel specific, and then finish it up with a joint presentation uh, a case study that we did uh, in uh, metals and mining pi world um, event in uh, a couple of months ago and uh, very excited with that summit story so with that i'll move forward this slide actually now go a little bit deeper on what uh, martin said about the digital transformation i really like the way uh, he placed that uh, six uh, uh, columns or areas that uh, delivering values but I think one of the things that starts with everything is this last bullet, which is the first connected phase. And I think I call that as digitization, uh, getting your sensors, IIoT, industrial IoT, or putting in a very robust enterprise data infrastructure. I mean, top of the line is Pi system. I have great experience with that, both as a customer and now as a partner, and then also working for Wayside And then uh, the newer things like Wayside of Cloud Services. By the way, we integrate with uh, all of these uh, in multiple areas. Um, as Martin said, that not just the real-time data, but also the future data. So this connection phase is very important for doing anything in the right-hand side, whether you're doing uh, forecasting or you're doing autonomous, this connected phase is very, very important. So assuming that's there in place, let's take the journey to the next level. In the next level, as you can see, um, and looking at Gardner and many other things, you already know this. Uh, different kinds of analytics, descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and then we'll go into prescriptive and autonomous. That makes this data that you have been collecting in your enterprise data infrastructure with your digitization strategy visible to multiple layers. And by visibility, I mean is that there are multiple types of visibility. One is that just putting in the raw data in, uh, in process book or Pi Vision and providing it to a customer or in your nice little lab that you have, but also visible in the sense of there are things that used to happen in the plants was not available in other plants or in the corporate headquarter. So this uh, infrastructure makes that happen. It also makes this overall working transparent across groups, across vendors, across your ecosystem. And what we have noticed in the last few years, especially as you transition from industry 3.0 to 4.0, as uh, Martin was talking about, that there have been some isolated success in the areas of machine learning and AI with linear models, rule-based action, forecasting, and uh, especially in the steel industry, we have seen some predictive maintenance there, some of the digital twins have come in. So those are all great isolated um, successes, and I think we can build on top of that. So for the rest of the presentation, what uh, Roberto and I are going to do is to talk about this last phase, what we call as autonomous or adaptive, a part of this uh, in journey to the industry 4.0, which starts with this thing called prescription or prescriptive uh, analytics. Um, it's, it, the system should be self-learning when you deploy a system, whether it's an AI or machine learning, whatever you're doing it. Um, once you deploy it on uh, July 1st, come September 1st, it has deviated. It has to, because the new things gets put on. The industrial world or the operations area keeps on changing. Uh, people don't understand that the new sensors are coming in. Sometimes you take a thermocouple that's not in there. You put something else. You're going uh, running your fans with the flow, but you change it to run it with Ampere or something. So all those things changes. So does the model needs to self-learn and change. It needs to be also providing autonomous guidance, So which means that it uh, supervises action. If the operator wants to make the system run it, it should be capable of running it at one time. We call that auto steering, which means that when the operator wants the AI to run their systems, it can run. And more importantly, it needs to be 
repeatable and enterprise ready. By that I mean is that an isolated success in one part of the uh, company in one plant should be able to be repeatable across all 65 plants. Same thing, it needs to be capable of connecting to the enterprise data infrastructure, the ERP systems and everything, and being deployed in a very rapid pace. So that's what we call as the journey to the enterprise um, or industry 4.0. What we are delivering with that is what we are a platform, AI platform company. So our motto is industrialization of AI. And that means that when you are taking this ML or Python routines and you're going to some place and creating those, you need to be able to know that when you are deploying this, these modules in any customer with almost solving any problems, you need to depend on that it was developed by specification. It's almost like a building block story. What we provide is this building blocks for these solutions that you will see coming up next. And another thing we do also is to solve real world complex problems. So let's go and uh, deep dive into something else. By the way, keep on the question and answer Q&A coming. I think uh, Tom is taking care of that and, and we'll come back to the end of it to solve it. So this is, I would say, one slide which try to describe what this autonomous or AI pilot uh, way of working is. And uh, in, to describe that, I would like to invite Dr. Linares to uh, jump in and uh, describe him, and then I'll come back to describe the architecture. Roberto. Yes. Uh, thank you, Prabal. Um, as we see in, in industry, uh, our operators uh, are facing the issue that they need to operate different processes, different pieces of equipment, assets. And, and what happens is that they are limited in the amount of time that they can spend for each piece of equipment. So what, uh, what is the result? That they operate in a comfort zone, but that comfort zone doesn't necessarily mean that it's the optimum zone. Uh, uh, if you are going to see, let's say, you're looking for better throughput, or you're looking for better quality or low, uh, better um, energy consumption, lower energy consumption. So basically what we do uh, is that we take that data, of operational data that exists uh, in your pie system. Let's say you have five years of operation. We read that, all of that information, and then we create what we call an AI pilot zone. And that is a broader zone where we can safely operate. And then we co uh, configure some constraints uh, because we know that in processes, we cannot, let's say, go beyond a, a certain emission. Let's say NOx, CO, right? The flow rates, what is the actual capacity of the process? What is the capacity for pressure, the required uh, uh, typical temperatures? So all of those uh, are configured within the system. And then uh, basically what we're doing is we're taking the process from a point that is in a comfort place to a place that now is going to be comfortable, but we operate it autonomously. So this will, this will mean that we will have a higher yield or higher recovery depending on our operational and business requirements and goals. And then um, typically what you see, uh, once uh, you have mapped the system, you have uh, now the dynamics uh, mapped and the forecasting is working nicely and then we do performance optimization, and then we go into auto steer mode. We, uh, you know, in this, you see the, in the right, the graph, we can take uh, the variable, the state variables, let's say to optimize energy. For example, this, we will go deeper in a, in a case uh, with a customer that was presented uh, at the uh, in a previous event in OSI. And we are basically taking uh, uh, the secondary air temperature of that kiln in, uh, into a much higher level in which we, now we are saving energy and we have um, a much more stable operation. Prabhu, uh, could you go to the uh, infrastructure? And, mm -hmm. Thank you, Roberto. Mm -hmm. So um, what we're going to do right now is to go deeper into our architecture just to show you how we are connected with um, the Pi system and the other data sources and how and um, a um, patient industrial AI pilot can work from taking you from prediction, prescription, and auto steer mode. So on the left hand side, AI needs data. So let's just be very clear about it. And AI, industrial AI, needs lots of data. And uh, one of the best data sources for that is the Pi system. 
and it can be also OSI sub cloud services, but I mean, the in, OSI sub infrastructure is the best and AI is data hungry. Industrial AI is very, very data hungry. As you can know that we need historical data, we need the current streaming data, and then we need an ability to predict and forecast and use the future data from Pi system um, infrastructure to actually put that back. So that's what's on the left. But in addition to the time series data, um, to actually create some of these uh, operational AI pilot models, we will also need access to images, the videos, the sounds, uh, some of the unstructured data, log files. Sometimes we also have a full uh, set of AI tools to read um, uh, handwritten things and, and OCR it and a lot of things. So, so that's what the data thing is. What we have created in by working with our very, very stellar set of um, engineering people and product team is a data machine or a data uh, scale, scaling platform that can take all of these data and kind of provide the context to it. And it's continuous and self-learning, which means that new types of data that comes in, will add it. And so what you're seeing on the right-hand side is in the bottom of it, that's our platform. That's what the things are built on. Now we develop one of these models, as uh, Roberto will go into more detail. He was showing you a cooler model in that previous thing. It can be a blast furnace or whatever. But once that model is actually in place and it goes through three phases. And the three phases are, or three modes are, prediction, prescription, and auto -seer. Let me go deeper into that. A prediction means that it's what you will call as forecasting. So you're looking at a temperature or a pressure, and you want to know what the temperature and the pressure will be in five minutes, 15 minutes, or whatever time frame is that. That's pretty simple. Sometimes you might want to do forecasting and prediction at a scale, and that's what we are capable of. You not only want to do forecasting of one variable, but based on many things, you might want to do much more accurate forecasting of what that exactly that secondary air temperature will be, what Robert was talking about. And you will see that based on the objectives that you have actually set there, it may not be giving you what you actually wanted your operations to do, which means provide maximize the secondary air temperature, and it's not, it's not possible. There's something else is going on. You need to do something. And that's where the second mode comes in, the prescription. It's almost like you have a goal for your weight or whatever, or your cholesterol level, it doesn't matter. And you go to the doctor and he or she actually prescribes you several things. It can be medicines, can be uh, walking every day, um, doing some exercises, eating healthy. That's all in that prescription zone. And that's exactly what Pitchum in the CLAI pilot does. It provides with the guidance or actually set points in this case that the operator needs to do to take that back into the objectives that your designers have put on. That's a what we call as providing guidance to the operator. That's what the prescription mode is. The third mode is that when this is validated, when these pilots, AI pilots are running, then you can actually have uh, the system, or the in this case, the Petroleum Industrial AI Pilot to put those set points back into the control system so that actually it can run based on the prescriptions that AI Pilot is providing. It's almost like having your super pilot. And, and that's what the three phases are. We will go into more details into different types of AI Pilots when Roberto uh, comes back uh, later, Asset AI Pilot, Process AI Pilot, and Operational Excellence. Let's spend just two seconds here on this uh, connectivity layer. So we've been using very, very successful with using Pi Cloud Connect, and now we are also working with OCS to do that. We are a cloud-based services right now, but actually our platform can actually work on any places, but whether it's on the edge, on-premise, or on the cloud, the implementation that you will see from um, Semex, the case study, is actually running it from the cloud, uh, connected with Pi Cloud Connect, with the enterprise data infrastructure, working end-to-end -end like absolutely smooth. So very, very pleased with what Pi system and the infrastructure have provided for this solution. Uh, one more thing is that, as you can see, it's bi-directional. So it means that the streaming data in this case is coming to the Pitchum platform, and then we are taking it back in the same exact way, the predictions and prescriptions, taking it all the way back. So with that, I think I'm going to hand over to Tom. Uh, I'm to Martin and Tom to take it to the next page. Excellent. Thank you, Prabal. 
At this time, we're going to be conducting another poll. You can find the polling feature to the right of your screen. Question, do you have dedicated machine learning and data scientists in your company working with operations teams? The answers are yes, we have a chief digital officer and a dedicated data science team, or we have a few isolated data science people in various departments. C, we are planning to hire a few data scientists in the next few months, or D, what is data science? Um, Prabal, uh, Roberto, and Martin, um, how, with the way technology is advancing today, how critical is the, are these roles within operations teams, in your opinion? Yes, Prabal, I, I, I'll start and, and let Roberto and Martin comment. I think um, what we have been noticing is that there is already an awareness and, um, and kind of impetus within these companies and, and still companies very, very well ahead of this, and having a set of data science teams can go beyond just looking at that data and, and doing something more with it. And I think, again, uh, together with Pi System, that actually is a very, very good area. And we in Pitchum completely have, have this uh, strategy where more people can actually start using AI and kind of giving it AI for everyone. And so uh, we are seeing this movement. Um, back to Martin. Martin, what are you seeing? Yeah, thank you, uh, Prabal. I, I think um, data scientists is actually a new role. Uh, it's not very spread. Uh, we don't see it very often. We don't see very often uh, industrial companies that, that do have data scientists. Although, I'm not saying that they're not using uh, those kind of services. Uh, I mean, there are partners, I mean, like Petuum, I mean, there are partners that, that have data scientists and that can work with, with, uh, with those uh, companies. But um, so far, I think it, it's still a new role. It is, it is going to be evolving for sure. Uh, I think it's just a matter of time that before organizations realize that, that there is great value in the data and they need someone that can really help them dig into it and get the most out of it in terms of value. So, um, uh, Roberto, any, any other comments? What I, what I would say is that once they see the magic of AI, and that has been my personal experience, that they, um, the, the customer in operations comes back to us with more ideas on how to implement, um, you know, other problems that they want to solve through AI, through machine learning. They are also themselves are interested to know more about it. That doesn't make them data scientists, but uh, because they know the, the power, right? And as I think that companies will start evolving as they see more uh, results of AI, you will get more data science people working closely with operations. That's, that's the future we see. Well, thank you, gentlemen. All right, the results are in, and it's quite fascinating. Um, it's, it's a mixed bag between half, uh, half do have a few isolated data scientists in various departments, but then the other 50%, you know, they ha either have a chief digital uh, officer or in a dedicated science team, or they have not started with data science yet. So thank you very much for everyone's participation. and. Um, Roberto, I will pass it back over to you. Thank you. All right. So uh, the next part of the presentation uh, is about uh, the AI pilot product uh, for, uh, for uh, specifically for steel. And uh, basically, we, we are going to talk about different cases where AI is applied and uh, how uh, this uh, uh, platform that probably uh, uh, explain if it can be configured and what is the process to train, uh, what is the process to validate, and what is the process of, to opera, operationalize this uh, AI pilot. So we will go into uh, some uh, some examples. So for example, let's say uh, we, in the case of the blast furnace, we can apply the AI pilot. Uh, the, the first thing that we need to do is to take data, right, uh, historical data. With that information, uh, we get all of the mapping of the variables. This can be 100, 200 variables. We are not limited by the amount uh, of variables that can go into this model. So that's a very uh, you know, big change compared to a classical model of first, first principles. Here, we can take all of the variables, all of the data, temperature, pressures, flow rates, et cetera. So we get, get, we get that information, and then 
Uh, we feed that into an, our, our, an, our AI platform. Um, our machine learning engineers then select uh, all of the pipeline, AI pipeline within the platform. These uh, modules are already in the platform, so they just need to be uh, put together so that they will be able to do the predictions for the variables that we want to bound or we want to control. Let's say that we want to have a forecasted value, uh, let's say for CO concentration, or we would like to have a forecasted value for temperature or for throughput. All of those uh, 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 variables are now being predicted. And now we have a forecast for these variables uh, at right now, what will be the value of five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and what will be the values if we change uh, these, uh, these set points, for example. So we have a very good now prediction. We know that we have now described the dynamics of the system. And this means that we know the relationship between the variables and also the relationship in time. So that's, that's also very, very important. Um, then um, once we, we pass that phase, basically we have solved the problem. It, it's, it's kind of interesting to me uh, working in these projects. The, once we do this, the second uh, step, the prescription, is really is just taking uh, working with uh, with you to establish what are the objectives. Okay, what do you want to do currently with this asset? Do we want more pro more throughput? Do we want to uh, reduce energy? Do we have two objectives, three objectives? Even the, if the objectives are conflicting, uh, we we can take them all and then put some weights uh, for each one. So we define the objectives. But then we consider the constraints. Okay. Well, what is the gas composition that, uh, I, I, how far I can go with oxygen, with CO? What is the height of the burden, burden uh, surface, for example? So we, we code all of these uh, uh, configuration items within the AI pilot. And then we, we of course, if we're gonna provide prescriptions, we need to know what are those uh, prescriptions that uh, are gonna be applied to the system, right? And, and basically these are the knobs that are moved by the operator, as simple as that. If the operator is moving three things, four, uh, four variables, we will map those. And then in, the, in that second step, basically what we have is prescriptions that will try to get to the objective, right? Optimize the objective, let's say get to the maximum, get to the minimum, or stabilize. It could be that in other cases, we want to stabilize. So we have those prescriptions, uh, th those, th let's say in this case, there are three values. So those three values will give you, let's say for this case, the maximum throughput. Then what happens uh, after, let's say a week or two weeks that a subject matter expert, some, uh, an operator plays with those values, enter the manual in the system, see how the system reacts. And it, it goes to the process uh, to, to, uh, where you feel now comfortable because the values are within the ranges uh, that are normal uh, for operation. In fact, the model, the model is data driven, means that we have read all of this information from uh, all these uh, years, and we know that we are prescribing something that we have, the, the uh, AI has seen before. Well, find the final, and the final step, we just need to send those results back to the control system. And then we, we send those results, and now we can run this in auto steer mode. Of course, uh, it, can, it has to be still supervised by the operator. And then we will have runtime of the auto steer, and then we will see that we will have a stable operation. We will maximize, for example, in this case, the trip for, uh, for this blast furnace. But that's, in general, uh, the process. And then, uh, but the, the, the good thing about these, these models are that these models are um, data driven. Uh, they are very fast. You know, I, I, uh, my experience uh, working with the platform is the map. Once you do the mapping and get the data, this process is very fast, it, regardless of the number of variables uh, that are in the system. So if we go, to, for example, to a, a kiln uh, asset out of uh, AI pilot, in that case, let's say that we, uh, you know, this, this is applicable. Uh, I mean, we, uh, we use rotary kilns. Uh, for pelletization plants, also for uh, to uh, for uh, sponge iron uh, production, right? So here uh, probably you have two objectives: you want to maximize the, the throughput, you uh, might want to minimize the cold flow rate, or you might want to have a stability, let's say, for the main drive or the kiln that tells you something about the internal temperature.
So, but those object objectives are described by you. The, uh, you know, as, as your, you as your business know know better what is your objective. You know, we 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 just configure it for you. Then we consider constraints. For example, here we the, we can consider the CO CO two concentrations, the exit bed temperature, and then we again this in the same at the same process and in the previous example we provide the uh, the optimum uh, the value that we achieve the optimum like the iron flow rate cold flow rate. If you have other uh, knobs that you move, uh, we we can we can include them. We can have uh, we we have systems in which we have let's say 100 variables. Uh, with 20, uh, let's say, with 20 uh, bounds and or constraints, and then we are moving, let's say, five, six uh, variables at a time. So, um, and then we go into outer steer. Uh, I have uh, another uh, example, and this could be a more more complex example because uh, in this case we uh, we are looking at the whole uh, process of uh, direct uh, direct reduction of. Uh, uh, to, to produce uh, iron, right? Um, in, in this case, we uh, we can take data from all of these processes. It could be uh, the furnace, the preheater, the heat exchangers, any meter information, uh, you know, it could be that compre for compressors or fans. We take everything. Let's say that we take the RPMs, we take the kilowatt hour amps, all of, you know, it, here we don't discriminate. We prefer more information because the, 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 we, are, we are trying to build a super operator that knows everything. So the more we know, the more the, the system can uh, predict, right? So, so for example, in this case, uh, let's say, again, we, let's say we want to maximize the throughput, minimize the uh, use of natural gas, consider, of course, the constraints uh, in the process. Uh, and this could be also environmental constraints or safety constraints. Uh, if we have hydrogen, let's say hydrogen and CO, you know, uh, all of those uh, can be uh, coded into the system. And then, and then we will have our uh, our prescriptions, and then we can feedback uh, into into the control. So, uh, in I would like to show you one of the uh, the cases in which we we are work working on, and and this is now public information. Um, this is a very complex process with a lot of, um, 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 I mean, variables. They have around, uh, let's say, 70 variables, a lot of degrees of freedom. Uh, we, we want to optimize really three, uh, two or three variables, depending on, their, uh, some, depending on the nature of the cooler. And uh, we um, uh, ba basically need to move eight variables. So we need to move eight variables at a time in order to achieve the, the, the optimum. So that is humanly not possible. So what happens is that the operation typically works in a suboptimum. Now, once, once we put the auto steer on for the AI pilot, suddenly we see an increase uh, of secondary air temperature. We re re reduce the variability uh, of those temperatures as well, which in turn help uh, the rotary kiln. Um, we also see a less acceleration, acceleration and deacceleration, which in turn will help uh, the equipment, uh, which basically works with very hot materials, to be run smooth. That in time it will be good for maintenance as well. So the, the important thing is that this change uh, we uh, we have tracked this change. Uh, the customer has tracked the change, and it's very stable. The difference. Uh, between the suboptimum to the optimum, and is significant uh, from the point of economic point of view as well, because that's energy uh, uh, that can be used uh, for the manufacturing uh, of cement, which is this product in this case. So, just to summarize, um, you know, this uh, this was a very complex process. As I said, many variables. Uh, the, the variables. Uh, also are in the nature of the process, right? The process could be very uh, uh, coarse material, very fine material, but the system learns to deal with these changes. So the, the, the issue was that it was not possible to have a good prediction before, a, a prediction that will take into consideration all of the effects. And, and the idea was to, to build something that will support the operators, uh, get the best uh, ways of operating 
of the best operator replicated every time. And even if you have a new operator, they can use autopilot, right? So, uh, so, so in numerically speaking, uh, what, what we're getting is that uh, more than 100 Fahrenheit uh, uh, temp uh, sustained uh, difference in secondary air, which is uh, a very good amount of uh, energy going back to the kiln, also increasing tertiary air, and then um, even a decrease in, uh, well, a, a slight increase in the product, uh, which is uh, reasonable. But all of these uh, factors can be changed by changing with, with factors depending on the objectives uh, of the customer. So, uh, so in 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 general, you know, I I would like to pass this to uh, to Prabal. Would you like to? Yeah. Thank you so much, sir, Roberto. And also, due to time, I'll I'll, I'll go this thing. Um, what we try to do and um, is to give you a very quick glimpse of uh, the AI pilot for uh, uh, steel industry. Uh, there are modules that we are working on together with our, our customers and also with OSI stuff to uh, connect this uh, very, very important um, uh, industry um, uh, to our AI pilot work. Um, and then one of the things that um, I, I think this, this sentence actually came in um, from a customer, and I want to just repeat it here, is that transforming traditional factories into smart factories to our clients, that's almost like Petroleum industrial is like having a golden day of operations repeated and sustained every day. And this is a true statement. And that's exactly what uh, Roberto and I tried to present. And Roberto presented that, uh, you know, the operator being on the comfort zone into the AI pilot zone so that you can maximize, minimize, or stabilize whatever objectives you have and have that over and over. Uh, we have asset AI pilots, process AI pilots, and operational excellence. Come back to us, connect with us, and I'll pass this to Martin. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, uh, Prabal and Roberto. This was a very good uh, uh, discussion on AI. And actually, uh, the CEMEX uh, example you gave was a very good presentation we've had during the last Pi World Conference in San Francisco. It is actually, for those of you that are listening, if you want to have a uh, a view of uh, the customer testimonial, uh, it's actually available now on YouTube. So if you do uh, go on YouTube and you search for My Pi Story and Semex, uh, you will see the customer talking about this. Um, and hopefully uh, one of our listeners today will come and present at, the, at our next Pi World, either in Gothenburg in September or uh, next one in San Francisco. So just uh, to recap here, um, <clears throat> There are three keys to success uh, that we've discussed here. So first one is your, your organization needs a clear change transformation story from the management. So you need to embark into a digital transformation journey. Uh, we see that there is a lot of value uh, there. Most of you have already started. That's what we've seen in the polling questions. Uh, but again, value does not come only from one area. It comes from many different areas. Second thing is you need to implement a robust operational data infrastructure. If it's not already in place, this is one of the key aspects that will allow you to manage real-time historical and future data. Because as we've seen with AI, we can predict what will come in the future. So you need to manage all that data. And then the third thing is, of course, you need to first empower your people. And then you need to have them, of course, use that, that operational data for, to take better decisions. And then all of this, that operational data infrastructure that you will have put in place because you have a clear digital transformation strategy will allow you to enable artificial intelligence for eventually autonomous operations as we have seen uh, in that example. So where should you start? Well, we've talked about having a real-time operational data infrastructure. Uh, we are of course talking about the ability to collect all the data from all the different assets that we see in the bottom. I mean, those are just examples, but the idea is to collect that data from those assets, contextualize it so that it means sense for AI tools, and then bring it to either uh, predictive analytics or AI tools so that we can deliver value to the organization in each of those different areas in terms of process efficiency, asset health, quality, et cetera. So of course, it all starts with the data and, and, and both OSI Soft and Petuum strongly believe that people with data can transform their world. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Tom. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. 
Thank you, Martin. And once again, thank you, Roberto and Cabal, for presenting as well today. At this time, we'll be taking questions from our audience. Once again, please use the Q&A option to the right of your WebEx interface, and we will answer your questions as they arrive. Um, if you have happened to change your view to full screen, the Q&A option may be now located at the bottom of your screen, so keep an eye out for that. And we're going to have a couple questions coming in at this moment. Our first question, uh, Martin, this is referring to you. At the beginning, you talked about asset reliability and implementing condition-based maintenance or predictive maintenance. Um, are, is it possible to use the Pi system to manage that, or is there a need for additional software? Well, thank you, Tom. Actually, this is a very good question. Um, condition-based maintenance or condition-based environment monitoring or condition-based process monitoring can all be implemented within the Pi system. And it, it, it is implemented throughout the, what we call the asset framework using analytics, asset analytics and event frames. So I mean, this can all be implemented within your real-time operational infrastructure or, or your, your data infrastructure. Uh, of course, if you want to go a step further to predictive maintenance or even prescriptive maintenance, then, of course, there will be a need to, for specialized predictive analytics or AI tools. But, but it all starts with the fact that you need to have access to all that operational data. So the, the answer is yes, it can all be implemented within your PI system. Great, thank you, Martin. Our next question, if a company is already collecting the data, how do they get to know which area needs improvement? Well, uh, again, this is Martin speaking here. Um, I would say there's probably, uh, I mean, most companies are struggling. It can be either on, on specific assets or asset reliability, then of course, asset health is one of the key aspects to look at. Uh, some other companies, I mean, it, it all starts with the strategic plan that you have within your organization. If you need to produce more tonnage, then definitely this is probably something that, that you will want to look at process efficiency. If costs are becoming an issue within your organization and, and within your strategic plan, there's a cost issue to address, then energy utilization or, or asset, health, asset health, again, might be some areas of improvement. Um, so, so, again, that is difficult to answer clearly, but it all starts with, with the strategic, strategic plan that you have in place within your organization. And Thank if you, I may add, uh, Jump in, uh, Tom and uh, Martin. It's uh, one, one of the areas in the steel that we are seeing is, uh, as you said, the energy, the product quality, even the uh, emissions uh, as an overall thing. And then, of course, helping with the um, operations the running of the equipment themselves is, I think, very, very uh, important. Uh, also, something that I will mention, I would, I would, would like to say is that basically the business sets the drivers, right? Uh, do, are we already sold 100% of our capabil uh, capacity? Well, we need to have more throughput, and that will be one objective. But sometimes we are, let's say, a 50% capacity, and we want to optimize energy. But the important thing is uh, to build a system that can take um, both scenarios and we can tune that according to the business and operational requirements. I think that's, that's something that is important. Thank you very much. Prabal, Roberto, this next question is for you. In regards to some of the um, solutions that you provided in your presentation, our next, our next attendee wants to know, how long does it take to get AI projects like these implemented? It's an excellent, excellent question. And I will give you a two-part answer to that. So, so what we are uh, presenting today is actually uh, a product that we launched uh, together uh, at the Pi World uh, in, in April. So this is actually a product play. So uh, Petroleum Industrial AI Pilot uh, is a product, or a suite of products. And um, if you actually looked at our last slide, you'd see some of the areas, asset autopilot, process autopilot, and operational excellence. Those are merely configuration because if you have a, again, if you have connected, you have an enterprise data infrastructure, the best in class like Pi system, is merely connecting to that and within a few weeks, you will actually see results uh, from prediction prescriptions and then we will work together with you uh, for, the, for the auto steer part. If we are looking into an AI, AI is a vast space, and if you're looking into AI for logistics and other things and all that, we are also working together. 
um, uh, with our customers, it might take a little bit longer. But again, we're talking per petrum at least because we're using a product slash platform approach. It's in weeks. Come and connect with us and we'll be very happy to go into details. Thank you. Our next question. Uh, is it possible to connect our existing blast furnace and stove control systems to be able to collect all the data or do we need to replace it completely? No, okay, no. well, maybe I can take this one. Um, of course, uh, of course. Uh, again, that, that's a very good question because most customers do not know if, if they need to replace all their existing technology and, and actually uh, it, there's no need to replace any control systems or any PLC or SCADA system. Everything that you already have in place can be connected with the Pi system. The Pi system does connect to more than 400 different systems. So from specific, specific ones to standard ones that are using standard interface types like OPC. So the power of, of a single operational infrastructure is actually to be able to connect to all your different control systems without having the need to change them and bring all that operational data into one system. So one single version of the truth. Yes, and also we, we respect uh, whatever control system and regulatory control is al already there. We are basically acting as a super operator, just providing the prescriptions that the operator will change. But we, uh, we see them in place very nicely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, gentlemen. Our next question. In the first section, you were talking about empowering people with digital tools. Uh, what kind of tools will help in improving efficiency? Okay, well, again, uh, I can take that one. Uh, first thing is, is uh, visual tools. I mean, just having the, uh, the, the ability or the availability to the real-time data, just having, just knowing what's happening. Of course, people will tell me, well, we can have it. The operator has that information in front of him um, from his PLC or his control system. That's true that that's the information from the asset he's managing, but, but does he really know what's happening upstream and downstream? Can, he have an, can, it, have a, can it has an impact on, on, on his uh, operation? So the answer is yes. And, and that's where we will empower people with the tool of, of having access to the information that is real time, but that is also coming from different assets, from different processes with, which are upstream or downstream. So that's, that's the beauty of it. So first tool is having a visual, uh, visual interface, so having access to a visual interface. And not only for operators, I mean, process engineers in their office, they might not operate the equipment, but they might want to investigate into that equipment, what's happening in real time with that equipment. So and that's another great area of improvement. That's, all, that's another area where we're bringing a lot of improvement with process engineers able to investigate and, and, and fine tune the process. Um, same thing, I mean, once, once you have implemented your real-time infrastructure or your operational data infrastructure, and then you start implementing condition-based monitoring, it can be for maintenance, can be for process, can be for environment, etc. then you can start seeing results because it, it, it becomes automated. So you don't need to have someone looking at it you can be notified when there's something that, that's happening. And you can even integrate with your CMMS systems, with your ERP system to, to, to automate the process. So those are the tools that we're mainly talking about. And of, yeah. of course, if I can add, I mean, uh, of course, as you've seen during the webinar, you can, you can also go a step further and, and integrate with, with tools, with AI tools or predictive analytics tools. But, but, but let's start walking before we run again. Great, thank you, Martin. We're almost to the end of the hour, so I'll just uh, leave off with two more questions from our audience. And once again, if we were unable to get to your question today, we will certainly follow up with you via email after the webinar. So our next question, um, we have one um, audience member that asked, do you have an AI pilot for SAG milling? Yes, we, we have a, a, a pilot for mills, uh, any type of mill. We have been, do, uh, we have been doing uh, all types of uh, mills, and we have already autopilot ready. Yes, please reach out to us. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. And then our last question for the, for the day, 
Will the AI save us time, save any time for our operators, or will this just take longer because they have to learn more? Prabal, you want to say? Yeah, this is an excellent question. This is an question. So we have, um, first of all, and we, um, um, both with Semex and then other customers we're working on, we are not in the anything is eliminating the operators or anything like that. This is more of uh, helping them to concentrate on other areas that need focus. For example, if you're in a cement uh, factory, if you're running the mills, like ball mills and vertical mills through this uh, AI pilot with, um, and the cooler, then they can focus on, say, something upset condition that's going on in the kiln to focus on that. Um, in addition to that, uh, the operators can also do high level adjustments beyond just what they are doing to firefight today. And so, as Roberto said, the super operator which is Petroleum Industrial AI Pilot, can help and augment all of these uh, areas. And so I don't think it's an extra work. In fact, uh, for all our experiences that we have been going to this many factories and plants, um, there have been a very, very good uh, coordination between the plant people and, and the corporate and our team. And in fact, Roberto was there in uh, commissioning one of the AI pilots for one plant uh, in uh, Mexico last week. So. So that's it's a very very good journey, and we have a good process in place to go through a five-step process from um, assessment to connect to configure to go through this validation process with uh, prescribe, predict, prescribe, and uh, auto steer. Great, thank you very much, Prabal. So, folks, we've reached the end of the hour. Um, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's presentation. If you do happen to have any questions following today's webinar, um, please feel free to reach out to us via one of our follow-up emails coming to you shortly. Once again, thank you for attending, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And once again, Martin, Prabal, Roberto, thank you very much for presenting this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.